workplace happiness, what is that? Is it achievable? Is it even something that you want to get into? What if you lose control over the standards and procedures that make your business and your standards of care exceptional? In today's episode, I talked to Declan Edwards. He is the founder of the BU Happiness College. And Declan talks about all things happiness, what it means in this new trust economy with the pandemic and workplace well-being, and what does it mean to this workforce to actually have happiness in their work. I'm Valerie Ling. I'm excited to share this next 15 or 20 minutes or so with you delving into workplace happiness with Declan Edwards. To speak with Declan Edwards today from the BU Happiness College. Declan and I have known each other for a few years and we've done a couple of podcast type things, haven't we, Declan? Yes, yes. You've been on (laughs) my podcast before and we had you do an amazing guest talk on burnout for our members at the BU Happiness College. So it's it's nice to finally be returning the favour. Brilliant. So Declan, why don't we start with that? Tell us a bit about you, Declan, the human being, (laughs) and then tell us a little bit about BU. Yeah, beautiful. So my story, I guess a lot of people ask about what led to me being so interested in in happiness and the science of happiness and understanding happiness. Um, I think a lot of people make the mistake when they meet me, they assume, oh, he's always been quite a happy guy. And so it's a natural Mm -hmm. thing for him to go study this. Um, but the reality is actually quite different. You know, I grew up uh, very much of the belief that I would end up in the military. My father's in the military, my grandfather's police force, his father's military. Oh. For as long back as I could trace, that was sort of the pathway um, of, of definitely men in our family. And I remember at some level, part of me going, well, that's just what success and happiness looks like. That's the right way to live a good life. You know, I had this very clearly defined blueprint as guess for for what it meant to live a good life um but it wasn't my blueprint and thankfully i didn't get into the military i actually applied to to get into the military and didn't get in for medical reasons i'm an asthmatic and it really threw me because i went okay for many years now i've had this definition of a happy and successful life that i felt had been ripped away from me and so i was lost and i went well if that's not what a happy meaningful life is going to be for me what is and I think that's quite a big question to be asking I was 19 at the time um unfortunately at the time I'd also just jumped on social media for the first time and started comparing myself to everyone else's highlights reel and going well they look really happy so maybe I need to do what they're doing and a lot of the people I first started looking at were very much into health and fitness and I'd struggled with my body image I'd struggled with um disordered eating patterns for a while and my self-esteem was quite low at the time from the, the big change in sort of not going to the military. And I went, oh, obviously I'm not happy. It's because I don't have a six pack. If I lose weight, then I'll be happy. And so I chased that definition of happiness for a while. And of course, as I'm sure a lot of people could guess, losing weight didn't automatically make me happy in who I was. In fact, it ended up worsening a lot of the struggles I had internally. Anyway, fast forward a few years of going through that, I kind of went, hang on, I keep making the same mistake. I keep chasing happiness, A, outside of myself, and B, by someone else's definition of happiness. And thankfully, I I had a really good friend and mentor and kind of my first coach at the time, a man by the name of Sebastian Terry, who was kind of my first role model on getting really intentional about defining what a happy and meaningful life meant to me. And so he helped me kind of begin asking those big questions, begin learning about it. And I fell in love with it. And, you know, it really helped me learn how to manage my mind and emotions more effectively. And I went, hang on, this is something I'm really passionate about. Let's find out what's happening here. And a couple of years uh, later, uh, there was a postgraduate degree being offered in positive psychology in Central Queensland University. I'd done my Bachelor of Health and went, this is something I'm really quite interested in. It's really making a difference in my life. Maybe I want to go study that. And I'm so thankful that I did because that obviously then led to studying positive psychology, acceptance and commitment therapy, all these different modalities that I know you're a big fan of as well. And then um, 
creating what became BU Happiness College of going, I wish I learned this stuff earlier. I wish there was a space where I felt comfortable mm. to go and learn about these tools and modalities and to talk about it um, with this really proactive and strengths focused lens rather than I think particularly at the time it's getting better now, but back then there was still such a stigma and a reactive lens to mental health and to working on your wellbeing. Mm. It was like, we wait until we hit rock bottom and then we go see mm. a psychologist or a therapist or a counselor. Mm. And mm. it was nice to sort of go, well, hang on. I, I want to focus more on how do I go from, you know, the, the worried well, I think they call it, or the neutral to plus 10. Um, so that's a little bit of a backstory on like me and my story and what led to yeah. what Happiness College. I'm glad I asked Declan. I don't think I knew a lot of that. Mm. <laughs> it really sounds like it's a story of seeking identity and meaning uh, and, 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 finding yourself needing to redirect I guess your search for that mm. and so tell me in BU Happiness College uh, what do you do I mean it, it really sounds like a really great place to be a part of thank you yeah we're <laughs> very proud to be now um very proud to be a multi-award winning social enterprise which is nice um you know from day one I wanted to create around this idea of growing global happiness and I looked at that going, well, hang on, if we empowered people with the, the tools and the techniques and the, the scientific theories, as well as with a supportive community that they felt connected to and part of. So we say it's about the tools and the team at BU. Um, what a difference we could make. And so what we do there is it's run like a US collegiate system. So we have members in freshman year, sophomore, junior, senior. They work one on one with a happiness coach who's got qualifications in those areas we spoke about where they can work really closely to get their support, but they also have access to a full online college of workshops, replays, downloadable tools and resources, mm. PDFs, guides. I kind of mm. joke it's like Netflix, but better for you. Um, <laughs> and so it's been nice to create this, this real community in this ecosystem around yeah. Yeah. living a happy life and the ripple effect that that spreads because I can yeah. put my hand up and say, I'm a better husband, a better leader, a better friend, a better family member when I'm happy and fulfilled compared to when yeah. I'm struck, burnt out and absolutely exhausted. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and what's the average age range of your clientele? The, the average we tend to find is like the late 20s, early 30s. It's a quite a big transition moment for a lot of people in their life, right? Like they've gone through their traditional schooling. They're now in the workforce for a few years. You know, they might have a partner or a family and they're taking these bigger life decisions. I think the common theme with a lot of them is they're realizing that for a lot of years now they've put their own well-being as a low priority. They've been giving back to everyone else but themselves. They're also reaching that point that I reached of kind of questioning their own definition of happiness and success and going, I've pursued this. Is this actually the life that I want to live? And they're realizing that they've spent all this time in traditional education building technical skills, very specific to their role and their occupation, but not much on, and I hate the term soft skills, so we're going to call them human skills. They haven't spent much time on their human skills, right? Of like learning how to manage their mind and emotions. So yeah, that 25 through to 35 is definitely most common for us. But in saying that, the youngest graduate we've had of BU is 18 years old. The eldest we had was in her late 60s, um, which was yeah. incredible. Um, so I think, again, there's this real humanistic factor of exploring and understanding what it means to live a happy and fulfilling life. I think that resonates yeah. with a lot of people. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. I mean, that's a really early stage, you know, sort of 18 to 25. Um, it's interesting to me that there's motivation to seek out uh, your services. What's the primary motivation? Why do people do it? Big one, especially over the last few years, burnout is a huge one. Uh, stress and overwhelm. Um, and honestly, like lack of self-esteem and a positive relationship with themselves. Um, which I know I, we've been talking a lot with members lately about the idea of if you look at self-confidence, self-compassion, mm. self-esteem, mm. self-worth, they all start with the same word, which is self. And so it might be a question to a lot of it, people when they enter our college is like, how well do you actually know you? Like, do you know your values? Mm. Do you know what matters to you in life? Like, and a lot of people mm. don't know that. And so you kind of go, well, how are we going to have, mm. a, how are we have confidence in someone we don't know yet? How are we going to be compassionate towards someone that we really don't understand? And so I think giving them the yeah. tools and the space to intentionally explore and create a sense of self um, has been really meaningful for us over the years. 
Now you and I are going to drill down so much more into this uh, as part of the Private Practice Leadership Accelerator group that I um, am running. But just for today, just for the broader community, I can also talk heaps about this thing called quiet quitting, yeah. uh, which is essentially about employees. And, and I think it's been attributed to a younger workforce, so your Gen Zs, not so much your, your millennials, although I, I think they are part of this movement, if you like, mm -hmm. but an early career workforce who are basically saying, we had it with the hustle culture, uh, you know, we, we give and give and give and we do and do and do. We don't, not getting the reward, not getting the recognition. So what's the point of sacrificing ourselves? So rather than resigning, we're just going to pull back. We're going to check out of this, um, you know, hustle and do more culture and just do what we need to do and strive for work-life balance. And it's been the trending topic for a while because you've got employers saying, well, that's not right. You know, these, these this is like, it's it's ripping us off. And you've got probably the broader workforce going, this has been a problem for a long time. <laughs> Quiet quitting is a name that was given for something we already know about. I'm curious, what are your broad thoughts about what's happening? Yeah, and I've been asked kind of quite a bit too. We've, in the last couple of years at BU, opened up the workplace happiness consulting arm of the company. So we're working quite closely with a lot of organizations to measure and manage and understand their culture. So naturally, this is something coming up a lot. My thoughts around, I've been explaining to a lot of workplaces lately, this idea of whenever we see big societal change, which is what we've been through in the last couple of years in particular, there is a period of an overcorrection, kind of like Newton's cradle, like the little desk toys with the five silver balls, you lift one up, let go, it ricochets. I think what we're in at the moment is the slight overcorrect. Now, what I mean by that is I think there's a lot of merit and value to some of the underlying principles of quiet quitting, if we, if we use that term. So the value of the underlying principles, boundaries, self-prioritization and being able to look after yourself and not give all of yourself to your work and being more intentional around what work-life integration looks like. Again, I hesitate to use the term work-life balance. However, I think the part that doesn't resonate with me and where I can see a lot of employers struggling with is this quiet part. And I would argue quiet quitting and quiet firing are both equally problematic issues, right? And yeah. both the, the reason they're both so problematic is the quiet part. I think what we need to have more of is bold, vulnerable, brave conversations. Now, I understand that this is an equal responsibility on, on employees learning how to have those, how to have those conversations um, and set those boundaries in a clear way rather than sort of in a quiet way. Um, but also, I think we need, to, we need to create psychologically safe organizations where people feel they can do that. And right? if someone feels they're going to be punished or victimized or vilified, for speaking up and setting boundaries or for pushing back or for prioritizing their needs, the likelihood of them being able to have those clear boundary setting conversations is so low. So I do think there's a responsibility on employers and as organizations to go, are we creating a space where our staff feel psychologically safe to voice their mm. dissent and their dissatisfaction mm. um, and their needs? And if not, what can we do to shift that? Right? Because if we, if we are creating a safe space, then yes, it's up to the employee to be able to capitalize that. So. Yeah, that would be my response. And I think we're in an overcorrect. We're going to come back, hopefully, to neutral. I don't think we should go back to the way things were before the pandemic. I don't think that worked for anyone. The hustle and grind work lifestyle, I hope, is something of the past. Um, but I also don't think that this is the solution long term either. And final question, Declan. So you yourself, business owner, student, husband, parent as well? Not yet. Yes. Only the two dogs. Not yet. Okay, well, dog, pet, parent, owner, <laughs> employer. How do you maintain your own happiness? Yeah, so a big part for me, it's actually one of my favorite ones lately. I ask myself on a daily basis, what is one thing my heart needs from me today? Because I find myself very often living from a to-do list or from my head of like, this is the logical, the smart, the strategic thing to do. These are all the things on my to-do list. I'm sure you know, as a business owner, that list is endless. It doesn't end, right? Mm -hmm. And I can often get lost in that. 
And I think like anyone else, especially when I run a social enterprise where it's so much about caring and giving and being there to support others, it's very easy for me to have my own needs slip to the back burner and go low on the priority list. So I've just found that very simple question of, hey, what is one thing my heart needs for me today? Actually spending the time listening to the answer and like tuning into myself, but then prioritizing it. And it looks different each day, right? So for example, yesterday, I had a terrible sleep the night before and I went, actually, you know what? I'm really quite exhausted after the last couple of weeks. I think it's beneficial for me to take a much slower day today. I reorganized a lot of my meetings. I took a slow downtime day and I was able to prioritize that for myself. Whereas today when I checked in this morning, what was my heart need from me today? It just said, you know what? At some point today, a nice little walk, something away from the computer would be lovely. That's something I can do in 15 minutes. Right? So I think as a, as a tangible oh. practice, that one's been making a huge difference for me lately in maintaining my own happiness. Oh, I love that, Declan. Love that. Thank you so much for spending time with me on my podcast. It's always so great to connect. Um, if you're looking to connect with Declan, just type in the description for the links to BU Happiness College. <laughs>